the next, a little bit more than an hour, we want to have a very engaging conversation, starting with the next session, the beginning, hopefully we are all energized, about Ethiopia and really bringing Ethiopia in the spotlight. Uh, over the last years, uh, having Sanka here, we, we were always trying to have East Africa focus, but it happened to be that Ethiopia was always a little bit falling off the map, and um, that we wanted to change this year, um, and really bringing Ethiopia in the spotlight. We have heard from a lot of investors with whom we have been working over the last years. A lot of them have an Ethiopia focus, or they say East Africa focus. But then Ethiopia is always a little bit different period, a little bit different. People don't really know how to enter it because it is uh, yeah, somehow a post-socialist country in the economic transition. Government plays a very strong role. So it's, it has a very different economic climate. So we wanted to really bring the spotlight here and say, talk to investors, talk to entrepreneurs who have managed to be very successful in Ethiopia and hear from them how is it to do business there and what are the opportunities and white spaces for investors, for businesses and also for ecosystem players to come in. Uh, so we have um, three great speakers here today with us. Um, we have Hans Schrader from IFC World Bank with the East Africa Regional League. And uh, we will have this introduction as we, as we go later. I will share a little bit about his background. We are very happy to have Greg Metro, Managing Director from Schultz Global Investors, one of the only funds, private equity investors, who is investing in uh, more the, not really the early, early stage, but businesses that are small and growing um, in, <coughs> in different sectors, but agri sector and food business is, is one of the big sectors. And we have Joseph Shields, the CEO and Managing Director of Eat Your Chicken, which is one of the businesses, one of the only businesses that actually also achieved to get private equity from, from, from Acumen Fund or having an impact investor on board. So we will have their three perspectives and uh, hopefully have a lot of interaction and conversations with all of you. We don't want to make it a very panel-led only conversation, but really provide an opportunity to all of you to, to engage with the panelists. Unfortunately, we had a few cancellations. You, you, you saw that uh, the country director of GIZ uh, was supposed to be here. He had to cancel us because we, he was unwell. But um, GIZ is, is setting up an agribusiness incubator there, so he wanted to share a bit about this. But uh, I think we can follow up. I will brief those who are interested in Ethiopia um, on what, what actors like GIZ are doing in the region. So why are we talking about Ethiopia? Just to you know, bring again some numbers um, into the focus here. I think uh, it's well established that Ethiopia is the second most populous country uh, in Africa, and that's why a lot of businesses are looking at Ethiopia and don't ask why Ethiopia, or but really, how can I enter? Uh, so it, it is established that you know, it, it, it is an interesting market from just the sheer size of, of that market opportunity. We know that 50% of the GDP is coming from agriculture, so. Um, so there is an opportunity definitely there with the opening up of the economy there. Uh, the agri-business uh, sector um, is uh, increasingly in the spotlight of a lot of investors and multinationals who are looking uh, to, to invest in Ethiopia. And most of the exports are coming from, 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 from agriculture. And you know that uh, with a pretty close economy, exports are very important uh, for, yeah, to keep the, uh, the, the foreign currency going, so um, most of the exports are uh, coming from the agricultural sector. Um, in terms of doing business ranking, it is at 146, it's not amazing, but it's better than a lot of other African countries as well. Um, and we have seen that um, in terms of FDI, um, we have seen an immense increase over the last years, and it is one of the destinations in Africa that has received the most foreign direct investments uh, in the last year. So from that perspective, it's, it's really one of the largest economies in Africa, fourth largest economy, and predicted to be the third largest by 2025. So a lot of people are saying, you know, we should, it's not a question if we should go to Ethiopia, but really how and when. And that's what we want to uh, want to discuss today. So just, again, some graphs. You see FDI has been increasing rapidly. Um, and we, we recently, as, uh, as Intelica, we were involved in a, in a study that um, did a feasibility of an agribusiness incubator in Ethiopia, and we worked together with Bain and also did a large uh, investor survey, so that was led by Bain and Company actually, who talked to more than 100 investors and asked them how do they look at, uh, at Ethiopia. And to, uh, when we look at it, 
um, there are some uh, some some things that drive investments, but there are also still some uh, some some issues that make it a little tricky. So in terms of positive things uh, that investors are saying, you have strong macroeconomic indicators. You have a lot of stability because of um, the strong role of the government of the government who can create a conducive situation for investors. Uh, you have cheap available imports that makes it now interesting for a lot of manufacturing actors uh, to, to move to Ethiopia as an alternative um, a destination. But in terms of not so good side, you, you have government bureaucracy, um, you sometimes have, you have good relationships with the government, it's good for you, but you also have a lot of unfavorable laws and regulations that make it a little complex for a lot of the investors. That was the feedback. Um, and, and partly you have difficult business conditions. We will dive into this, what this actually means from those who are actually investing and doing business there. But still, nevertheless, 40% of the investors that were surveyed said that they would invest again or that they would be investing um, in the next five years. So it seems to be a high interest from those who, have, uh, um, who we have spoken to and those who are partly uh, large multinationals that were in, in somewhere in the value chain of agri and food processing, so uh, large interest. Uh, if we look again, where, where has most of the capital gone in the last years? Um, Agriculture is one of the sectors that is uh, very interesting for a lot of the uh, non-DFI, uh, non-development finance institution impact investors. So, um, as I said, Acumen Fund is active there. Nova Star is one of the impact funds that's also looking at Ethiopia, and agribusiness are one of the one of the big destinations or sectors. Um, so, we see that um, that trend. In terms of what, where do we actually see opportunities from our little scoping study that we did? Um, in terms of high impact sectors, you see uh, honey as one of the, uh, the big impact sectors that is interestingly uh, seeing a lot of uh, attraction. You see, um, and a lot of um, in, in teff, which is one of the grains that's uh, a lot, uh, there's a lot of interest in it by the whole health food movement because it is um, it's a very um, healthy and um, yeah, um, free grain. So. Um, in the US and in Western markets really love that uh, that's, the demand is increasing. Uh, we see uh, coffee obviously as a huge uh, huge opportunity, um, but also uh, the, the cotton industry, textile, um, is, is, a, is a sector that's growing uh, and having a lot of opportunities in the whole chain. Um, but um, in, in addition to the, uh, to the sectors, we also see a lot of opportunities in the ecosystem Itself. So financial service providers providing uh, services to farmers uh, and to those along the value chain, um, those actors who are providing talent and increase uh, the capacity level um, in, in Ethiopia can do business, can, can tap into these business opportunities, creating or fostering higher quality standards if you are in this space, uh, that's a, a big opportunity. Storage, everything related to storage, packaging, logistics, huge opportunity. And um, yeah, generally strengthening the, the, the pool of, of, of entrepreneurs in Ethiopia. Uh, this is really where the ecosystem opportunity lies. So with this a little bit of a context, where are we with Ethiopia from, uh, from, from our work? We want to now really dive into conversations with those who are doing business and who are investing. So I would like to ask on stage again um, our, our three speakers. Hans, please come on stage, and Greg and Joe, please come on stage. So you can switch the projector off again. So I would like, uh, first of all, to ask each of you to briefly introduce yourself and what are you doing in, it, in Ethiopia? How are you tapping into, into the Ethiopian uh, opportunity? And uh, can we switch the projector off? <coughs> and uh, where do you really see the biggest opportunity um, specifically in the in the agri? Okay, so thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Hans Schrader, as I was introduced. I work for the World Bank in the Trading Competitiveness Global Practice Group. And within that group, there's a division called Competitive Sectors. And in that group, 
we work to support the development of sectors that are naturally competitive for our country. And how do we choose those? Often it's about the reach. Uh, is it, do those sectors employ, have the opportunity to employ a lot of people? Are they inclusive? Uh, are they relatively competitive versus other sectors um, that, are being, that, are, that are done by neighbors? Um, so in Ethiopia, so, well, so that's, the, that's the work that I'm involved in. I try to build um, uh, lending operations and what we call non-lending technical assistance projects to support the competitiveness of certain value chains. I moved to Africa, uh, to Nairobi, uh, about six months ago, so I'm relatively new in the region, and I still have my notes on uh, Ethiopia here. Uh, I came from uh, East Asia Pacific region. So when I came here, I was tasked with two responsibilities, to set up two value chain projects in Ethiopia and Tanzania around dairy and poultry. Coincidentally, we have dairy and dairy and poultry represented here today, so this is very interesting for me. Maybe I can stop there. Yeah. Yeah. So Greg, um, Shows Global Investors is one of the one of the only funds. So what was what drove you to to get there? Maybe you can introduce yourself and say why Ethiopia for you and Shows. Sure, thank you. So I'm Greg Metro, and I'm the Managing Director for Schultz Global Investments in Ethiopia. And as mentioned before, we're the first private equity fund uh, in Ethiopia that focuses just on investing in, in private companies in Ethiopia. Uh, and we were founded on the ground in 2008 with uh, uh, the Schultz family, and we raised our first fund in 2013. And in 2008, it's very interesting, it's a very different uh, context than right now. Uh, FDI was only $300 million. There had never been a private equity investment. Uh, uh, local entrepreneurs had no idea what um, working with an investor was like and very little experience. And uh, a lot of people thought the founder of our company was crazy for uh, being the first private equity investor in, in Ethiopia. Uh, but fast forward to today and, and you see these incredible stats. GDP growth has been 10% for almost 15 years. Uh, the World Economic Forum said that Ethiopia is the fastest growing economy in the world. Um, and foreign investment now is about $1.5 billion. And it's a, a hot country for a lot of investors and getting more, more interesting. And, and what attracted us is that um, Gabriel Schultz, the founder of the company, saw what Ethiopia could become. And the perception was quite different then. You know, so the perception was a lot more weighted towards the negative um, detractors that, uh, that Stephanie showed in one of her slides. So that, that was more of the focus, and also the instabil instability of the region and uh, the geographical location. There was the perceptions about Ethiopia that were in incorrect. And, and that's what drew us there initially, was that there was this big perception gap. That the reality on the ground was quite different in terms of the economic growth, the need for capital, government's role, or its responsible role in developing the economy. So there was a lot of positive developments that we saw uh, that, that attracted us there. And of course, there are tons of challenges, but we uh, we saw a lot of the opportunity. Um, so our, our fund, we've made uh, six investments to date. Uh, two of them are agribusiness. So we've invested in the first co uh, commercial size coffee roasting business. Uh, and we just, finished, we just closed an investment in the uh, largest dairy producer, and now the largest dairy producer with our investment uh, in family milk. And our coffee investment is in uh, Jalanera Coffee, which uh, uh, sells under the Chirara brand name. Uh, and agribusiness is one of the sectors that we are focused on, and for obvious reasons, it's, uh, it's such a large part of the economy. It's going to play a key role in uh, the economy modernizing and developing, along with um, uh, light manufacturing and industrialization. Uh, we're focused on uh, a lot of sectors within agribusiness, but two that we're particularly attracted at and looking for opportunities now are in uh, sesame seed processing and uh, leather processing. And the uh, main reason is that there's so much value add that's being lost uh, to processors overseas. So when the raw hides for leather or the raw seeds are exported, all the value is created abroad. That happens with coffee, and we saw the same opportunity with coffee where uh, the raw beans are exported. That's almost all the exports from Ethiopia, and so why, why can't we process the, the coffee here, roast it, and uh, create our own high-end brand that we can sell abroad. And now 40% uh, of the revenue for our coffee business is in export, um, 
which were, were the largest exporter of um, roasted coffee beans in Ethiopia. And we see the same opportunity in a lot of other sectors within agribusiness, and uh, particularly leather and seeds. So Joe, coming, coming to you, uh, why, why Ethiopia for you? Why? I mean, you could have chosen many other places as well, and maybe you can share that. Sure. I'm Joseph Shields, the executive director of Ethiopian. Um, as you can tell, this is not the most ideal situation. My voice is not great. Apparently, unlike several of the other members of this, uh, this uh, panel and, and earlier today, I'm a bit more stubborn. Um, so perhaps that's why we've been successful in Ethiopia so far. Uh, so please bear with me, and if you can't hear me, just move me out of the room. Uh, we'll make sure we pass this along to these two folks. We definitely need us. Um, Ethiopia chicken began in 2010 by we took over a family government poultry farm. Um, we had the mission of providing uh, improved meat and eggs to every Ethiopian family. Uh, really simple. Uh, we've along that way, um, we've had support from funders ranging from AECF, uh, USAID, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, to Acumen Fund, to commercial capital from a private equity fund in Dubai. Um, so we've really spanned the spectrum here, and each of those has played an important and different role in the scale of our company. Um, we've become the market leader in Ethiopia. Um, we've built a company that has served and reached over 1 million households in Ethiopia, um, and we make a profit. Um, that's something that we're very proud of. Uh, we came to Ethiopia, frankly, for a couple of pretty simple reasons. Uh, one is the high growth rate. Uh, two is some of the political dynamics there, that it's stable. There's a relative lack of corruption when you compare it to the rest of Africa. Um, there's lack of petty theft. Uh, we were young Americans trying to set up a new business, and you know, my business partner almost bought a coffee farm, or uh, sorry, almost bought a coffee chain from a barista in Uganda. That wasn't actually going to end up being his property, obviously. Um, and so that's, I, I think for us, the reality of Ethiopia is that those factors help to make it a, a good place to do business uh, relative, to the rest of, um, relative to the rest of the region. Uh, very importantly, there was a lack of competition. And I think that's still true today. I don't think that will still be true in five years. Um, I think by, uh, in 2010 when we went there, people wouldn't have been in this room. Uh, they would have asked why Ethiopia. It's famine, it's not a particularly large economy. I think now, as Stephanie alluded to, people are starting to ask how. Um, that's an important next step. I think the truth is that in five years from now, in 2020, people are going to be asking, is it too late? Did I let other people get to uh, get a head start? I'm not going to be able to catch up or build the market here. I think uh, that's the reality of the inflection point in Ethiopia is that right now. And so, uh, if you look at the opportunities, uh, is it that it's mostly driven by the large investors, the, the foreign guys who, who are coming in and who are driving yeah, the opportunities? Or what is the opportunities for, for startups or for smaller players also to come up? And if we are talking about Ethiopia shining, is it, you know, the big, uh, big large corporate entering and setting up a plant there, or is it actually that we are seeing more and more local entrepreneurs also coming up? I can address some of that. Um, Ethiopia suffers from a lack of entrepreneurs, and we are looking at, as looking at some of the statistics, there are 0 0.3 entrepreneurs per thousand, per um, one thousand people. In Ethiopia compared to 2.2 for, say, Brazil or Malaysia. And the challenges that you've identified there are also repeated um, regularly. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's really great to hear that some of the issues that you have not been facing um, are, well, that you're not facing some of the issues that you're hearing from domestic entrepreneurs or small businesses, where they do indicate that, that corruption is a, a disincentive. They indicate access to land is a huge issue. They indicate access to finance being a very important issue, access to power, another issue. Um, and then the bureaucracy, the regulatory framework, I think is underdeveloped for the amount of growth that we're seeing in Ethiopia for the domestic um, SME. Uh, we've also heard that the domestic SMEs have it harder than foreign investors. That was from a 2014 World Bank report. So I think there's some advantage to coming in as a foreign investor with a domestic partner. But I do, I, my concern is for the uh, domestic SMEs. Maybe I can take a, the next step. The, uh, uh, what, what we see is, is there's um, a lot of diaspora and uh, family businesses that uh, 
are very keen to, to set up uh, agribusinesses and upgrade ideas. So uh, there's a friend of mine who's uh, starting a chicken farm, but it's a pretty small scale. So I think a lot of the opportunities we, we see and come across and, and people starting businesses are, are locals. And uh, a lot of times we're sport that have a little bit of capital, but they're pretty, pretty small scale. And the larger scale projects uh, would tend to be foreign investment, but I'd say 80% of the pie, if I would guess, would be these smaller scale um, entrepreneurs that are, are starting businesses. How difficult is it to, to find investors from an investor point of view? Yeah, it's, um, there's tons of opportunities, but as you correctly practiced it, investable. Uh, so there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have a lot of ideas, but for what we're looking for is uh, established businesses because we're already investing in a very risky place, Ethiopia, that, that doesn't have the legal system or the developed commercial code to make it easy as an investor. So to um, lower the risk profile, uh, we look for established businesses that we can help bring to the next phase. And, and finding the established businesses is, is quite difficult. So right now when we're doing an industry scan and say something like uh, sesame seed processing, uh, while there are really very few uh, companies that are already processing the seeds, so we're going to have to find a company that's um, commercial grade sesame farming that we can help go to that next level. Um, and then there's the next layer, which is, it, is there an entrepreneur that is very progressive and open to investment and understand our, our business model and be un, uh, open to bringing in uh, new management and taking a step back, and that's often one of the hardest uh, hardest criteria to fill. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities, but uh, investable, there's, um, there's, there's much fewer, but there's enough. There's enough where we're, we're always evaluating five to 10 opportunities at, at any time, uh, because they're, they're, there's a big enough economy, a big enough country that uh, uh, there's always new, new businesses that, that are being formed. And so, Joe, um, coming to you, I mean, uh, looking at, I mean, a lot of people in the room are probably entrepreneurs who also think, you know, can I enter, can I go to Ethiopia, and how is the investment climate different there in terms of starting up a business or replicating a business or scaling a business to Ethiopia? To, to, to how was it different? I think you had previously also worked in other African contexts. What do we need to consider in terms of what what's different in Ethiopia? Sure, and, and can everyone hear me, by the way? <laughs> um, you know, one thing I'll, I'll add to, to what Greg is, is um, frankly, I think Ethiopia is a tough market for private equity. Um, it is very early stage, and where I think it is um, well suited right now is for corporates that are taking a long-term view that have operations elsewhere, um, and also um, for entrepreneurs who, I think for entrepreneurs generally, because of that lack of competition, uh, those are markets where entrepreneurs thrive. Uh, but it's, it's really a place where you want to have experience operating other places. It's, it's tough to start trying to operate in Ethiopia for the first time. And I think, um, as Hans said as well, frankly, as foreign investors, I think you do have advantages. Uh, you, you operate on a different, uh, you get different levels of access. I think you know, the, the main thing I'd say about generally operating in Ethiopia, to get to your question, Stephanie, is it's a market where you really have to learn how to do business. Um, what I mean by that is it's, it's not like everywhere else um, that you've operated before, where folks in this room who are used to operating in East Africa have been in. Um, it's, it's quite different, actually. Um, it is getting easier, but there are challenges. And so I, I said a couple of the things that led us to look at Ethiopia in the first place, uh, but I think some of those areas where there are key differences relative to other countries where you likely have more operating experience um, are, number one, understanding the rules and regulations. Uh, they're a bit more complicated. The legal industry is not as developed as you'd like it to be. It's one thing to have a difficult and complicated commercial code, be able to sit with a very uh, articulate lawyer who can work you through and give you the confidence that you're going to know how to get um, all of your ducks in a row. It's very different when you've got a poorly developed um, ecosystem around, I think, that uh, legal, financial, etc., uh, professional services where Ethiopia is trying to improve, um, but right now is behind a lot of the other countries in the region. Um, I think you have to be, also in Ethiopia, you have to be involved from end to end. And what I mean is, 
that we would have loved to get in and, and rely on a feed supplier. Um, there was no reliable feed suppliers that we felt comfortable working with. And so whether or not whether that's on your supply chain side or whether that's in building a lot more of your distribution network than you might have to do in other places, um, it means that you, you when you're looking at opportunities or you're trying to come into business, you've really got to deal with a much broader set of challenges than you might be used to dealing where you can focus on what you're thinking, your core uh, competencies, the core competencies and strengths are. Um, and I think the, the last thing that I'll mention on this is that uh, recruiting talent is hard. It is not a market that has the same depth of talent as, as can you where we are today. Um, and so the reality is that you've got to do a lot more work um, figuring out where you're going to get your senior management talent, but then also making a clear, deliberate, and strategic investments in your middle management if you're going to be able to scale. Uh, particularly in industries where, for example, SBC to be a poultry, where you don't really have other companies that you can source talent from. If you can't import middle management talent, it's too expensive. And so if you can't source it from other places, you've only got one option, which is to grow it. And that's a, that takes a lot of time. So can you elaborate a little bit more on what what you do actually different in going down the value chain and doing it and, and, and providing more support along? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think for us with that plan is on the supply chain, you know, our, our first our first commercial investment, we sold on the idea that we had to backward integrate into doing soybean farming. Um, we, we truly believe that. Now, fortunately, we've been very lucky there where the soybean um, production in Ethiopia, thanks a lot to efforts by USAID, um, by the Agricultural Transformation Agency, it's doubled year after year for essentially five years to where it's now a much more comfortable market. Um, but it went all the way down from it thinking that we had to farm our own soybeans, which I'll tell you, most poultry companies do not have that core competency is that they're also excellent farmers, and we certainly did not. Um, but on the other end, we now have a network of 1,250 agents throughout Ethiopia that allow us to reach 80% of the population. Most of those agents had never been poultry farmers before. So we had to make sure that we had a clear package to make it as easy as possible for them to be successful. Now, what we could find was a lot of entrepreneurs and small uh, small businesses that were willing to take risk and that when they saw other folks being successful, found the money. We didn't fund them. They paid in advance. Um, but we had to give them a lot of the support that they needed to enable, to be, uh, to enable them to be successful so that we had the distribution channel to reach all the way to our customers. I have a lot more questions, but I also want to now you know, engage the audience a bit I mean, and then Continue asking my question. I'd love to hear uh, exactly which industries are open for foreigners to invest in. I've talked to several people in the country, outside the country, to get greater clarity on it. I've read some of the documents issued by the government, but it's still somewhat unclear exactly where foreigners can invest in what industry to ensure that they will take Sure, I'll take that one. So the um uh, the industries that are closed uh, include retail, banking, um, logistics, and bread, for example, is an odd one where we've invested in a uh, pasta and biscuit uh, manufacturer, and they used to manufacture bread, but bread was a closed one. So you'll find there, there's large industries that are clearly defined, but there's a couple random ones here and there, like bread, and uh, a couple others that we've come across, but the main ones are uh, most of financial services except leasing. Um, the, uh, no, the leasing is open, and, but the uh, rest of financial services is closed. Telecom is closed. Uh, aviation, I would say, is closed. Uh, logistics is closed. And retail is closed. Uh, everything else is fair game, to my understanding. More the inputs, a bit more. Uh, yeah. Where on the value chain are the biggest opportunities? I guess I can start the. Um, and it, it, goes back to a little bit of my preamble, which is the areas that we find the most attractive now is, is where you can help um, large sectors of agribusiness, large sectors of GDP can help the value chain where uh, they're losing a lot of value when they, they export the raw uh, the, the, the raw farm goods. So uh, like I was saying before, leather and, and sesame where the raw hides and raw seeds are exported but um, not, not processed. And, and that, big piece of the value is lost overseas. And so I think in, in almost every big area of, of agribusiness that, that is happening. So 
uh, helping the businesses uh, gain scale, move up the value chain, um, invest in, in mechanization and uh, manufacturing uh, assets that uh, I think is, is pretty low hanging fruit. And a lot of times in these sectors, it just it's a lack of capital, lack of, of human talent, and uh, a lack of the, the technology. And it's very difficult to for a small investor to navigate the where's and wherefores of registration and then all of the licensing responsibilities that follow. Um, it's a disincentive to join it, um, especially if taxes are high. And that was one of the top five complaints in two business surveys that taxes, um, everyone's going to complain about taxes, but in this case they were complaining that taxes were particularly high. I don't know how high they are, or how high they are relative to other economies. Um, but when you have an environment that is not, at this point, particularly welcoming to a small new person who doesn't perhaps have a lot of business experience, I can see that as being an important disincentive. And uh, it's a little bit tough to answer the entrepreneurship, <clears throat> the entrepreneurship question. Um, but I, I imagine, obviously, Hans has the data here, but that the informal sector has a decent amount of entrepreneurship, and one of the key issues is entrepreneurship in the formal sector. Um, and I think that's a very, uh, dis I think there is a large informal sector in Ethiopia, and that's, that's an issue. Um, in, in terms of why are there the HR challenges there, um, I, I wish I could answer that. Um, you know, I think one of the key factors is that there simply haven't been a lot of multinationals and other companies that are able to give you the business skills that, um, that high-level professionals have. Um, you know, here you can hire folks who work to EY, who work to uh, excellent companies, and, and those companies have been here for a long time. Um, in Ethiopia. If thank God for Coke, I can't find a single salesperson who hasn't worked for Coca-Cola. <laughs> Do I agree with their entire training uh, program and curriculum and, and how their folks are, um, how they think? Uh, there's a big focus on sales and less of a focus on marketing? Um, certainly not. But without them, we'd really be starting from scratch. And so for me, that's actually one of the key things is that um, the multinationals coming in, and so far it's because telco is restricted. Because financial services are restricted, uh, the biggest ones have been in beverages along with a couple of other industries. Um, thank God for at least those early beginners because they start to develop something of an ecosystem of talent. Um, we need more of them in Ethiopia. And maybe just, just to add to that, because the human capital uh, challenge is, is a big one for us as well. So in almost all of our investments, we, we need to bring in uh, most of a, the management team. Uh, so the local entrepreneur uh, has gotten the business to a certain stage, and to bring it to the next level, we need to bring in professional management. Uh, and that's lacking big time in Ethiopia, and we've thought a lot about it, and I think one of the main reasons is the private sector is so young that it's been, it was communist for a long time, 20, 25 years ago, it opened up, uh, but then it was still primarily state-led, and the government uh, was involved in a lot of sectors, and a lot of multinationals have only recently started to enter. So there, there wasn't this mentality and training of global best practices. So for a lot of our executives, we actually looked to, to Kenya or Ethiopian diaspora that have uh, worked overseas at global companies and, and have these, these best practices of training that they can bring to Ethiopia. And um, it's, it's a challenge because then there's a, a cultural difference, but we find that's outweighed by um, by helping us capture some of the, the simple changes that we can make in the company to, to grow. Um, but I think a lot of that is driven by the sector being so so new, the private sector, whereas in Kenya, the economic growth has is, is always been led by the private sector, and that's always been open. So there's been more multinationals and more well-trained executives and deeper talent pool here. Um, I'd say two out of three management team members are uh, foreign trained. So most uh, all of our CFOs are Ethiopian, but they're diaspora. We've worked in the US or Europe and we've recruited them to come back. Uh, the CEOs tend to be, um, uh, we have two Kenyans. Um, so most of the time, the CEO, we're looking for industry expertise. And since milk processing is, is so new in Ethiopia, you can't find an experienced uh, milk processing executive um, or pasta and biscuits. So you really need to look overseas. And we find there's a pretty good talent pool 
and not as big of a uh, compensation gap with, with Kenya. Now, for our smaller investments, um, we just uh, we we just don't have the, the budget to hire someone for them. So that's where we, we find local uh, talent to run them until we get to a scale that we're ready to go to uh, a bit more professional manager. And I just wanted to reemphasize what you said. It's exactly. You finished my thought. It's. I wouldn't want to suggest that Ethiopians are not entrepreneurial. There's just such an informal market, and I'm sure that it's very busy. But it's, it, that's an inefficient way to grow out of a country. If you can harness that and push that into the formal market, I suspect you'd see growth rates even significantly higher. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, having left and worked in Germany, 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 Germany
successfully managed to um, export lamb. I was wondering, are you guys shipping it out as roasted, as a finished product, or are you roasting say, in the US or whichever markets that you're doing? Because I know it's usually pretty difficult to pre-roast and ship it as a finished product. So how are you going about it? And if you don't mind what brand is this that you guys are invested in? Sure, yeah, so it's um, Tarara is the, the brand name for the coffee, and uh, we do roast everything in Ethiopia, and then we airship it to uh, our customers overseas, and you're right, that is that is a challenge because the, the shelf life is short, shorter on, on roasted beans. Uh, so we do the packaging and the branding, uh, all the roasting in our, our uh, facility in Addis Ababa, and uh, then, then airship it to our, our clients in Germany, <coughs> Poland, and uh, Norway. That's where our export buyers are right now. Isn't it a bit expensive to air freight and what quantities would you be doing just by air freight? Yeah, it, it is expensive, but um, the, the demand and the pricing works where it's still as profitable as a domestic. Um, and the quantities, I don't know exactly, but mm -hmm. um, we, we have a, a certain uh, scale minimum that, or minimum size that it makes sense. Yeah, hi, my name is Oscar. Uh, I wanted to ask, what's the role of technology, especially in putting the sector, the agriculture sector, in, in Uganda together? You're looking from, from the supply chain to the route to market. And I know right now there's a lot of excitement around use of technology in agriculture. So what is the experience in, in Ethiopia, if it's there, and what has been the effect in keeping the value chains well, well running well? Can you briefly introduce yourself as a conversation session? Okay. I work for a media company called Business Mind. My name is Oscar. Yeah. Uh, that's a tough one because technology isn't really playing a big role in, in a lot of our investments uh, because the there's much lower hanging fruit that we're going after. Uh, so I, I don't know if you call a cold storage uh, collection tank technology, but that's a big part of our uh, strategy for collecting more milk um, for our dairy processor. Right now we're only doing one collection a day, um, and we've tripled capacity, so we have to find a new source of raw milk. And one, one way to do that is to collect twice a day. But to collect twice a day, we're going to have to have the farmers deposit the milk in our collection tank. Um, so and that, that's the extent of, of technology. We're not building uh, robust uh, IT systems or data collection systems. The first step is, is getting them to go um, paperless and, and try to or actually computerized. So right now, like our milk collection data is on paper form. So we're entering that into Excel. And that, that's the first first step. And, and then the next step will be ERP systems. Um, and and that, that's the extent of technology maybe a weighing, uh, a weighing station in our cement factory and our biscuit plant. So that, that's something that we introduce with our investment. So the, the technology is still pretty basic because we're, we're starting from a, a lack of technology. I have a question to actually all of you, but specifically to, to Hans, so where are the opportunities also in, in the ecosystem? I mean, we, are, we have incubators in the room. I see uh, Patricia from Prof. Africa. Uh, we, we know also a lot of yeah support providers are looking at it that they potentially replicate what they have done in Kenya. So where do you see the support system uh, <laughs> needs, so to say, uh, and there are opportunities for, for those in the, in the support. I'm inheriting a bit of a legacy program, or it's not coming into it midway. Um, the question on foreign currency um, access is huge for business development, and that's something the bank is, is addressing. Also, the question of access to land um, and the ability to secure land rights is very important um, for business development, so that's another area. That um, more specifically for the value chain work, we saw a lot of lack of confidence in the quality of inputs. And so when, we, when we're talking about technology, I, I totally agree with what Greg has said. It's not the first thing that we're concerned about. Um, it's really the productivity of the, um, the farmers that is where we see opportunity. And so there, the quality of feed, the ability to find a feed pr a provider that you have trust in the quality of that feed, and then the government can set standards about the quality of feed and enforce them. Uh, the quality of drugs, 90% of the drugs are imported, um, but they're, on, they're pretty much the same drugs that were imported two years ago, so it's not very progressive. Uh, there's a national uh, Ethiopian, 
won't try to call it. Uh, there's a, a company that makes um, vaccines, and they kill vaccines. But again, there's a lot of complaints about the quality of these vaccines. Uh, so if you have poor health services, with poor drugs and, and, and vaccines, uh, lack of access to quality feed, and your veterinarian services are poorly distributed, or there's a lack of confidence in the quality of the vets, your input production levels are going to suffer. And that's, I think, where the bank really wants to, to focus its, um, its attention. In, in ecosystems, I mean, one, one area that I don't think there's enough of is, is much longer term capital. Uh, so what, what, what Joe was saying is uh, um, private equity is difficult because we have a, a 10 year horizon at, at maximum, normally five to seven years. And uh, we don't normally invest in greenfields, uh, so brand, brand new business is unproven. And I, I think a lot of other private equity firms also don't. Uh, so um, an investor that only looked at greenfield projects and did a portfolio of greenfield projects, I think that would be a very interesting model and had a 20 year time horizon. Uh, and oftentimes that, that means corporates. Um, but um, I think that's a big opportunity. And, of course, for our companies, I'd love to see more more grant money and uh, uh, help with uh, developing ecosystems uh, for our companies as well. Do you have a view? Do you have a Okay. Quick question. My name is Duncan. I'm from FSC Kenya Challenge. Quick question to all my students. Are there other you know, value chain? Uh, my second question is, you know, how do you decide, or how, why these two particular values? Right. Okay. And, you know, in terms of, I'm um, particularly interested, especially in terms of impact and scalability. Right. Great question. Um, before I answer, is there any press here? Should I be cautious about that? Is this off the record? Uh, I came into Ethiopia four months ago, and I was looking at what the agricultural GP was doing, and I think they're in a state of transition. Um, they have focused principally on uh, productivity issues, which I've just expressed as being important, but they haven't looked anywhere else along the value chain, and they haven't applied productivity uh, questions to a particular value chain. That view in the bank group is changing, um, and I see it changing in other East African countries. Uh, so I believe that in the next cycle of engagement, the agricultural GP World Practice Group will be thinking more considerately towards how to improve the value chain, or to work within the value chain to improve the competitiveness of that, of that particular sector, rather than focus just on the extension of services that have been more traditional with the approach to the bank group. My group, which is uh, trading competitiveness, always looks at value chains. It's just now for the first time that we're looking at agriculture. And so we've been introduced now that we, we have a relationship with our ag colleagues. And these uh, two chains, the dairy and poultry, were chosen because of their um, properties for inclusive growth and for consistent income generation for uh, poorer farmers or those that are just commercializing uh, because they're not as cyclical as you would see in and we also think that there's opportunity in Ethiopia in both of those sectors. Hi, I'm uh, Marcel Logan. I'm from Beyond Capital Fund uh, Impact Investor. Uh, question for Greg and Joe. In thinking through the year, you know, the agribusiness, uh, agribusiness and scaling and, and the markets that you're looking at, how do you think through you know, domestic population as a market versus exports as a market, and what are the factors that kind of weigh into making those decisions about how you're kind of angling and strategizing um, in, 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 in your businesses and that you're looking at? Um, I, I wish I could provide or in, across the entire agriculture sector view, um, but for us, I mean, we look at poultry, um, and frankly, in order to be export oriented, um, you need to be able to compete price of maize and soybean uh, because you're competing with Brazil. Ethiopia, um, one, those prices are challenging, and number two, uh, transport out of the country is still quite expensive. Um, and so the, I think those are some substantial headwinds that um, I can't speak authoritatively to other products. 
um, but I imagine would be two of the first factors to look at in other products. Um, and for us, you know, if you're going to Ethiopia, we are talking about a, a country of nearly 100 million people. Um, and so I think uh, there's a huge domestic market. I think it's growing very rapidly. I think the mistake that many companies make uh, is that they come with products that can only focus on this, the NS market alone. Because Ethiopia is basically a country with one large city, and frankly, in my view, everything else is more like a rural, a rural market. Even the second tier cities, they've got a couple hundred thousand people. In terms of taste, in terms of supply systems, they're much more rural. And so I think those are some key questions to ask if you're coming in um, in FMCG, is, is how are you going to be able to make sure that you expand the size of your market and take advantage of the large population that is there? And I would say that um, looking at different sectors, each one is different, and um, uh, global prices also uh, would determine your, your mix of what you want to uh, focus on domestic versus export. So for example, we looked at a, a textile manufacturer and they were encouraged to export, but really they were almost losing money uh, when they were exporting. And so they, they really focused on the domestic market and they got a lot, in a lot of trouble with the government because the government wanted them to uh, just export. Uh, for a coffee business, the global prices are such that we can export uh, and do it very profitably and of course, we're a higher end brand and able to come in at premium prices, and that gives us the margin we need to, to export. Um, something like and milk is going to be focused on domestic markets, uh, but what Joe said is, is, is very accurate. Our business is only focused on honest, and we're going to be focusing on second tier cities in a year or two years, um, especially with something like um, longer shelf life milk. And, um, I'd say each, each business is different uh, within agribusiness, but it really depends on, on global pricing and if you could export uh, profitably. I have, a, I have a question again on the investment side of the, getting the financing gap. Do you see um, there is an interest of diaspora or domestic investors to actually uh, invest in businesses uh, in Ethiopia? Do you feel that there is a opportunity here for local angels to also close the financing gap? Uh, and is this happening already? Are we seeing this? Um, but there, there really isn't a VC community or a financing community for that. And wealthy families, it just, it, it's such a new concept that um, I, I think it's going to take a long time to develop. And they're really looking to private equity funds or impact investors to to raise money, or uh, most often, they just start businesses that are very low scale because that's the capital that they have access to, their own capital. Yeah, I think my experience from here is that we see a lot of investors who have come back in their diaspora, um, they come back with a small savings and they might become one of our outcomers. Um, I think the smaller businesses where you see a lot more activity, um, I think uh, switching to the other side of just how do you finance a business, I think once you get your proof of concept in Ethiopia, there's a lot more money looking for a home than there are homes. Um, I think that's one of the positive things for foreign entrepreneurs once you get to that proof of concept stage. I don't think that was necessarily true five years ago. We were ACF Acumen, uh, we were both their first investment in Ethiopia as well as our private uh, private equity fund. Um, but fortunately, because of what Paul, because of the fact that we have meetings like this, and because Ethiopia is much more uh, on the map, I think from a financing perspective for entrepreneurs, it's quite a strong, it has quite a strong case. Do we have more questions? And then I have a couple more. Um, so, uh, from an investment perspective, again, coming to back, uh, is it that you are you're providing much more? I mean, hands-on advisory. Yourself, and you would say any other fund that comes in needs to actually have technical assistance. This is one of the one of the implications that what you earlier described. Can you elaborate a bit? If I'm a new fund and I want to set up in Ethiopia, or I want to have a fund that's looking a lot at Ethiopia, how should I how should I operate as a fund? Yeah, and that, that's one of the big uh, differences I've seen with private equity in Asia versus uh, versus Ethiopia is that even though we were investing in Asian emerging economies, um, there's a lot more hands-on involvement you need to take in, in 
Ethiopia and I think in, in Africa more broadly when I'm talking about the private equity funds. Um, the first, first step is recruiting management. A lot of times in other economies, uh, markets, you would back a management team, whereas in, in Ethiopia, what I mentioned before is that we have to recruit new management because uh, it's a one entrepreneur who's running the company and he's running as well other family businesses and we need to bring in a focused professional team to, to run the company and that's the, the first step that requires a lot of hands-on involvement and that we make as, as part of our rights as an investor that we can appoint a management team or veto management team uh, because that's so critical to the success. And then once we recruit the team, then there's so much um, transformation that has to happen within the company. So, uh, for example, with our, our dairy business, we need to ramp up procurement. And then ramping up procurement is not just meeting more farmers, it's pro providing the collection tanks and co-ops, uh, negotiating the contracts with them, securing our assets uh, in the, the co-ops, um, uh, writing new agreements, finding new places, and, and all of that we try to help the management team. And what that means is we're almost meeting on a weekly basis with uh, each of our larger investments, and that's a lot more time on, on our end, and that means we have to be pretty innovative with uh, how we resource and, and our deals and the management teams we find so that we're not working 100 hours a week uh, trying to help all of our companies because we could work 100 hours a week doing that. I think you raise a really interesting approach, and I think it's underappreciated. Uh, typically, in the market, you'd expect for the dairy producer, the, the processor, to accept the, the milk, to collect the milk that you have delivered. Um, Greg's going out and getting it and making sure that his farmers are able to, to supply it and creating collection centers um, so that he can get the second milk in the afternoon. Um, this, is, this kind of goes beyond, and this is an issue that we saw in the market, um, in the market chain, and it's not something that we really see government role, although government could play a role in this. But I do think that the investors that are coming in now, it's going to be part of their success factors to go beyond a little bit about what's normally expected and to work within that chain to fill the gap. So um, a lot of donor money is now also looking at supporting entrepreneurship in, uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, as I said, uh, we, uh, we were supposed to have um, the country director of the ASF here who was setting up a agribusiness incubator potentially with the Limited Gates Foundation. So um, again, maybe from, from your perspective, uh, maybe you can give a perspective, where should they spend their money best, in a way, in order to, to, to enable uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in agri, but also in other sectors? Sure. Uh, sure. I, I that might be a question of my bakery. I, I can give it a try. Um, I think I think getting to proof of concept, and frankly, um, there, there's two areas. One is spurring more entrepreneurship on um, conversion to the formal sector, as I was alluded to earlier. And I think the second area where you need a lot is on capacity development. Uh, to me, these are the, the two fundamental <coughs> biggest, um, biggest issues. They're ones that companies simply cannot afford to invest in entirely themselves. And so I think that's an area where fortunately we're seeing a lot more focus on those issues, um, but we'd like to see continued focus. Because um, in Ethiopia, one of the issues we've run into is that um, a lot, now that we have some more multinationals, we're able to, as I said, some more professionalization. Um, some of the issues we have is that uh, folks, there's a lot of NGOs and donor organizations, um, and they take folks who otherwise would go to private sector opportunities. Um, it's not as if they, they pay more. Uh, we can pay that same amount, but as soon as someone has gone and worked for one of these organizations, uh, you know, we, we've seen more success getting fresh grads and then taking them through our system where they still have that motivation and frankly they're willing to work a 60 or a 70 hour a week. Um, and so I think a, a big area where uh, there, there needs to be additional investment is how do we help start building that capacity and how do we think about this in terms of how we're impacting the overall job market um, because it's a very small market. Um, I mean, you're, you're more on the financial uh, um, side as a, as a BFI, but what would you also expect from maybe the other some foundations or complementary organizations uh, to build um, in the future? Do you have a perspective on this from, from the world back to your uh, Not really, nothing, nothing beyond, um, you know, unfortunately, and you know, this might be a sign of the, the scale and success of it, that we haven't seen opportunities 
I, I've met to know entrepreneurs who've gone through the program. So uh, I don't have a perspective. My understanding of the program is that it probably would be graduates would be below our, our threshold. So I'm not, I'm not sure how big the uh, scale of the program is. Access to power is a concern, and it's disincentive to investment. But I, I don't know if those are agribusiness industries, um, probably not only, or how the agribusiness industries would, if you were to cut that out, what, what their responses to that would be. Um, uh, all of our companies face shortages, and the factory will be down. And if it's a small scale enough, uh, we have power generators. So for our milk processing facility, we have a backup generator that we use, and that's very expensive. So. Uh, um, I know with one of our companies we're looking at uh, some biofuels uh, for power generation, uh, but it's it's very new, and I would love to see alternative energy uh, sources because relying on the government grid is is challenging, very challenging. Yeah, I get to. Um, we've specifically designed a business model where for our smallholder farmers, our end users. We get them a six week old chicken because we know that they can have reliable supply of electricity. So we need to make sure while it needs to be heated, um, it's actually in uh, more commercial conditions where we can reach them. I think what, what Greg's getting to, and I think you'll hear this a lot, is um, any solutions that do come, they need to help solve the reliability issue, not just the availability issue. Uh, one, we're going to be investing in uh, refrigerated trucks uh, with the collection tanks that will be kept at a certain temperature, um, and then down downstream with our supply, our, our distribution agents, we're gonna start a leasing program where we uh, will we'll lease them some equipment, uh, say a, a small uh, refrigerator that uh, they can use to store the milk and uh, distribute it to the small retailers. And then we're gonna take a percentage of um, their, their revenue to pay back for the, uh, for the, the refrigerator. So I would, I would say leasing is interesting, especially because right now there's also the, the sector is open for foreign investment. There's going to be a lot, a lot of new leasing companies that pop up. So if there's a way that uh, your equipment could be leased, um, that, that, that would be attractive, especially for a business like ours. Best funding any projects now, and by them opening up offices back home, and getting rid of that private sector or business investment. Just yeah, I, I think they're just uh, planting the seeds for when banking is open for foreign investment. I, I'm not aware of them, them being active in the market, but uh, there's a lot of rumors or discussion that uh, Ethiopia, because to ascend to the WTO, they need to open up banking, so it's going to happen at some point. Is it five years, three years, 15 years? I, I don't know. I guess their, their plan is put a, one or two people on the ground and, um, and, and be first and develop relationships to um, be ready for one on the, the sectors that the, the government is uh, uh, behind is the, the first key criteria and uh, where local inputs uh, can be found in the country and uh, within our business uh, we're focusing on the bigger bigger pieces because we need to deploy a larger amount of capital so uh, honey, sesame seeds, uh, Leather and um, coffee and milk; those are those are areas we see a large amount of demand, um, not as much competition for moving up upscale up and um, more value-added products, and um, big export and domestic opportunities. Sure. <coughs> Pardon me. This is not the last I have today. Um, being able to use my voice, it's easy. Uh, I would I would say. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of sectors, and we've talked about the challenges of doing business in Ethiopia. Um, the truth is that if you're an East African country and you're in agriculture, um, and you're in a sector that uh, is open for investment in Ethiopia, I think you'll be surprised by the amount of support that you are able to get. And the other reality um, is that for corporates, for entrepreneurs who have this type of experience, is if you do want to call yourself an African country or an East African country five years from now. You're not going to be able to credibly do that if you're not in Ethiopia. And that's the reality. Everything isn't perfect about doing business there, um, but I think you see a lot of commitment from folks who have improved the ecosystem and improved the environment. Um, and for those of you who are, are willing to make that investment early, I think you'll be very successful and rewarded for that. And I think that's, you know, you're going to see that's certainly what 
Ethio chip and the S chip is making up here is that because we have been here this early, that means that as the market continues to develop, um, we're going to see profits from that. 